Hey there, Space Monkeys. So quick couple videos to show you some things you must do every day. These movements will help you offset the movement patterns that you experience or ingrain during cycling, right? So in the cycling position, what are we doing all the time? We are putting our spine into flexion. We're bringing our shoulders forward and we're lifting our chin. We're also tightening the front sides of our hips, typically. We're locking our ankles into a fixed range of movement. A lot of times people end up with tight hamstrings also in this pattern. So we want to move the body in different ways. And we want to do that not just with passive stretching, but with some load to the muscles. It's more effective to move the body in a way that engages muscular action near end range rather than simply passing, passively putting the muscle in that end range. So we're going to start with some simple neck stretches and movements. I like to do this on my knees sometimes, my toes tucked under, because it's a good stretch for my calves and my toes. Feet and ankles get really weak during cycling. So you can start by reaching your hand just under your ear at the top of your shoulder and pulling on the trap. And as you exhale for about three seconds, then you can inhale and I'm pushing my hand into my, my head into my hand for about three seconds. Then I'm going to exhale and let it get longer. And as I mentioned in my podcast, we don't want to stretch the muscles of the neck for too many seconds because they have a much higher density of muscle spindles of muscle spindles in the of receptor cells in the muscle spindles. You can pull your hand behind also that helps. And so if we overstretch the neck that can cause unhappy moments in your nervous system. And it can really freak out the muscles in your neck. Remember when we went from quadruped to biped, we took a huge risk to go upright. And to do that, we had to develop very sensitive muscles in our neck to help orient our eyes to the horizon. So we could scan for threats and also find prey. So these muscles are really sensitive. The next one you, you want to do is to pull your chin toward your chest. Since in the cycling position, we're almost always looking up the road like this with our chin high and this part of our neck stretched and this part of our neck wrinkly and in extension, we need to undo that movement pattern, right? So we're going to pull our chin down towards our chest. It's the same basic movement. You can begin by, begin by exhaling for about three seconds. Then as you inhale, actively push your head into your hands. Then exhale. That's called a contract, relax, stretch. And on the neck, we do a much shorter pattern, maybe two or three seconds in each uh, section. So we're exhaling and passively applying a stretch to the muscle. Then we're inhaling and actively pushing against resistance with that muscle. And then we're exhaling and feeling the muscle get longer. And this is a much more effective strategy for stretching muscles and fascia in general than passive stretching in my experience. So that kind of covers the neck Uh, I want to show you a few things with the shoulder. We can use a dowel like this to open our shoulders. So we're going to hold the dowel about like so. The wider your grip is, the easier it'll be. The narrower your grip is, the more challenging it'll be. Let's see if I give myself room here. And you want to hold the elbows straight. You want to keep the elbows locked. Then we're going to move our stability ball away and wants to come into my dowel path. And we're just going to do some laps over your head. I'm not quite going all the way in the bottom here. We'll do this to clear my obstacle there. So you're keeping the dowel horizontal and you want to look in the mirror and watch and see is your dowel crooked on one side? Or are you not able to make it because one shoulder's tighter? So you're bending the elbow or are you hiking a shoulder on one side to make it over? 
right? So we're trying to watch all those things. So look at yourself in the mirror and see if things look relatively symmetrical. I like this one because it's body weight, it's light tension, right? You can also, I don't have room for it here with this long dowel and being in this position, but you can also do around the world and go back and then on the side like this and then down in the front. You can get a shorter dowel to be standing to do that, right? So useful things for the shoulders because in the cycling position, again, our shoulders tend to protract and reach forward. So we want to offset that bread by stretching out the pec minor and loosening the shoulder girdle in all directions, right? We want our scapula to be able to glide on the rib cage, not be glued down to our rib cage. And we want our pec minor in particular to be loose or not loose. We want our pec minor to not be hyper facilitated and tight, which draws the shoulders in and stretches out the, the muscles that would keep the scapula in a proper orientation, right? Uh, namely the lower traps, which wrap around and bridge with the pec minor to pull the shoulder into protraction. So we're really opening up those lower traps. Super important. Uh, next, I want to go over some bridge exercises. So these will open the spine, right? They'll offset this pattern of flexion that we have. So remember, flexion is moving towards the fetal position. Extension or supination is moving away from the fetal position. You can think of supination as when a waiter holds a can of soup. This would be a supinated arm, for example, but it's basically expansion away from the midline. So there are several progressions to this bridge. One of the ones I talked about in the podcast is called a prone cobra. That's a pretty simple exercise. It looks like this. You're going to start with your chin towards your chest. So forehead's on the ground. You're going to put your hands by your side. Ankles go together. Then you're going to roll your, your thumbs out into the hitchhiker position. Lift your arms up towards the ceiling. And I'm also pushing them back this way like my finger is pointing. And then I'm gonna lift my sternum off the ground while keeping my ankles together. But notice that in the cycling position, we're gonna have a tendency to wanna do this because we're used to this position, but we're doing the same thing we always do on the bike. If we allow our chin to come up, we're making wrinkles at the back of our neck and we're stretching the skin long, which I don't really care that much about the skin, but I do care about the the muscle length tension relationships in the neck. So I'm going to keep my chin down and I'm going to extend my arms up, lifting my sternum off the ground. If I want to add difficulty, I can lift the feet, keeping the, the feet together, the inside blades of the feet together or the ankles as together as I can. So now we're in a prone cobra. And I can either do this dynamically by exhaling and then inhaling on the way up, Inhale, exhale, inhale, chin to chest, lifting the shoulders high off the ground and also down towards my butt. Exhale. I can also, of course, modify this and make it an alternating Superman. So I can put my arms here and I can lift the left leg and right arm. And I can alternate the other side. As I inhale, keeping my chin down, I don't want to lift my chin. Or I can lift both arms at once. Or if you're strong enough, you can do both arms and the feet. So all these exercises are going to tone the muscles on the posterior chain of the back, right? Along with some glute. And I like these exercises a lot because they're kind of whole body, right? But they're, they'll work, they'll tone the muscles of the posterior aspect of the torso, but they're not necessarily going to challenge your range of motion so much. So to get into range of motion more and be more active, we can work on a bridge. So of course, a hip bridge can look like this. We can push our hips up 
we can wrap our fingers underneath and tuck the shoulders and then push the hips even higher. Now I like this one because notice that it puts my chin towards my chest. So that's tidy. If you want to progress this exercise, go to one leg. Try to keep your hips steady. Don't let this hip drop, right? So I have to drive with the right glute really actively to not let this hip drop down here. I could even add some one-legged hip bridges if I wanted to. So be playful with these, right? The point is to explore different ways to move your body. They're going to offset your cycling movement pattern. So we need a little bit of education about what we're trying to do. And then it's up to you to explore what works. Keep the basic principles in mind of progression or regression of an exercise. If an exercise is way too hard for you, you need to regress it. Don't have a complex about it. Don't get bummed out about it. Just do less. Make the exercise easier, right? On the other hand, if an exercise isn't hard enough, then you might need to progress it. So there's no such thing as a good or bad exercise. There is a poorly prescribed exercise or a correctly prescribed exercise. Prescribe the correct exercise for yourself and you're going to make gains. Uh, give yourself an exercise that's way too difficult and you're either going to do it incorrectly and you won't get the benefits or you might injure yourself. And this is not constructive. The last thing you want to do in one of these exercises is injure yourself. So. If it feels really challenging or really threatening to something or really ouchy, that's your sign to stop doing it. Don't be a broken record and throttle yourself in an exercise just because you think that you're not going to be a good enough human being if you don't smash stuff. This isn't Hulk smash. This is intelligent movement, execution of movement with precision and skill. That's what this is. So next one is we can use the stability ball to help us mobilize our spine a little bit. So you can begin by just rolling out on the ball like so. And you can roll all the way over and put your hands here. And now we're in a supported bridge position. And this could be quite challenging for many people. But for some, it might not be so challenging. I've been doing this pretty regularly, so I can feel it, but it's not nuts. And the closer you bring your feet to the ball, the more you'll feel the tension, perhaps in the front side of your body. Right now, I feel a pretty good stretch in my, in my liver and my right lower ribs. So if I want to progress this exercise, I can begin to unweight my body off of the ball by pushing into the ground. And now you can see that I'm coming off the ball a little bit. I'm still supported some. So this is a great way to progress into a bridge without it being too much, is you can do gentle reps where you begin to push. I also like this because we're supinating the hands. We are extending the chest. We're offsetting our flexion pattern of the spine while we're cycling. We're also driving through the glutes here. Notice my toes can come off the ground. I can drive through the glutes and I can even get some tension across the SI joints and the sacrum and the sacro tuberous ligaments. I feel a nice release there, some length. Oh, that's nice. So I do this one pretty often, not every day, but quite often. You want to come out of that really slowly. If you have a tendency to get dizzy when you are inverted or go upside down, you want to use extreme caution during this exercise or maybe not do it at all. Some people get dizzy when they go upside down. You don't want to be inverted and then fall over or pass out or have anything like that happen or hurt your neck. So proceed with caution. Only use that exercise if you feel comfortable that you can be uh, inverted <clears throat> safely. Right? And then... When you're ready, you can progress to a full bridge and you can hold it for a few seconds or up to three minutes of total time under tension, which would be quite a bit for a full bridge, right? Now there are ways even to 
progress the bridge, when you're in bridge, you can extend one leg up. That's really challenging. I'm not gonna show you that one right now because I'm not sure I can do it at the moment. I have done it in the past, but we'll leave it as it is. The other exercise that I mentioned in my pod that I think is really important is stuff for the hips. We need to mobilize the hips and make sure the hips are loose. And this is absolutely critical for athletes, especially for cyclists. We tend to get tight in the front of our hip capsule right here, the anterior aspect of the hip, the front side of the hip. And for the record, and uh, any athlete who's got good range of motion should have about 10 degrees of hip extension, right? So I'll show you what that means. <clears throat> if I go into my lunge position here, if you were to draw a line, I could even use my dowel if I wanted to. to oops, sorry. To illustrate this, to go straight from the knee to the hip through the torso, I think this is gonna be about right. Let's see if I can do this here. That should be about right. Now you can see if I drop my hip forward of that, this would be about neutral. This would be hip extension. This is hip flexion. Anything behind here about is going to be hip flexion for my left hip. So, of course, when we're cycling, we're in hip flexion all the time. We're always riding around like this or like this. And when we're sitting at a desk, we're in hip flexion, right? So this is a problem because our hip becomes conditioned to only exist in flexion. And <clears throat> uh, if you do not use it, you will lose it. But also when we have really tight hips, it tends to cause problems. Our pedal stroke gets choppy, right? Uh, sometimes our hips become so tight in the anterior aspect that people have a hard time getting in the aero position or generating power at the top of the pedal stroke. That can also be due to hamstring tightness. There are lots of reasons for that. But in any case, none of it's good. And if you want to be a good cyclist, you got to have loose and open hips. So we need to open our hips in the front side. Of course, also we need the backside of the legs to be able to be open, the hamstrings need to be able to produce power while we're in a flexed and extended position in that cycling position, right? So the simple one to do with that is a lunge hamstring uh, <clears throat> stretch. So we can go into our deep lunge, which might look about like this, right? For some of you, it may not be that deep. You can support yourself on your hands. You can drive that hip into the ground. You can bring the knee and even pull the knee forward. So now I'm getting good flexion of the ankle, dorsiflexion of the ankle. I've got a good flexion knee and I've also, I'm deep in the hip, right? And then I can tuck my toes under and come back on this side. And now I'm on a right side hamstring stretch, right? So I can rock back and forth. So now I'm right side glute and calf. Uh, so deep in the hip flexion. And then here, I'm on the right side hamstring. And then I would reverse to go to the other side. Deep into the glute, and then into the hamstring, right? And notice that I've got my toes tucked under here again. This is important to flex the toes. And also this might work your ankle as well, depending on where you're tight. So she'll give you what you need, not what you want. Meaning the stretch will appear wherever you need it. Right, And I like this one also because it can be active. So if you want to apply more load to that hip, you can do a lunge and use your body weight to drive into it, right? The next one is a 90-90. So in order to perform this stretch, I give this one to a lot of my fitting clients. We start seated tall on our sit bones with about a 90 degree angle at each knee. And then you're going to just flop your legs over to one side. Now we need to spread the distance between our feet. So we have three 90 degree angles. One, two, three. So a 90 here, a 90 between the thighs, and a 90 here. And what we want to observe is, can you sit in this 90-90 position and have your sternum be above your pubic bone? So pubic bone, belly button, sternum. First of all, can you sit like that? Many people can't. They're twisted like this. What we're doing is we're working internal and external rotation of both hips one at a time. So this right thigh or femur, upper leg, 
is internally rotated. It's twisted in, inside like this. And the left one is twisted externally. It's twisted like that, right? Rotated like that, I'll say. And then we can do a cool thing where we win make a windshield wiper to the other side. Kaboom. Now we adjust our angles a little bit. Sometimes things wander. We go on about a 90 here and about a 90 here and about a 90 here. And then we settle in a bit and we observe. Can the sternum be over the pubic bone without excessive twisting of the hips? Where do you feel tension? Sometimes people will feel tension on the outside of the internally rotated leg. That would be common. Sometimes they'll feel it on the inside. You might need to go back and forth a few times to get a feel for it and loosen up the hips. If you haven't moved the hips in these planes much, they can be quite tight. I actually feel a fair amount of tension on the internal aspect of my left leg right now. Uh, the medial aspect of my thigh and my knee a little bit. So it's a little tight for me. So I'm going to work on that, right? So you can go back and forth and then you can begin to make a mobilization with the breath. If you're really uncomfortable here, use your hands to regress this exercise and just work the range of motion. As you become more comfortable, you can sit a little more forward and use the muscles of the external and internal rotators of the hip to make this movement. And then you can progress it by using your breath and rolling the pelvis forward over this leg. Here's our playground. Notice the position of your sternum relative to the foot and the knee in this range is our playground. So I can exhale and bring my sternum towards the knee. Inhale, exhale, bring my sternum towards the center of the leg, of the lower leg. Inhale and exhale and bring my sternum towards the foot. Right? So this is an active mobilization that's using the breath. What I'm doing is I'm exhaling and going to end range, which I would define as about a seven out of 10 in terms of tension, wherever that tension is getting your attention, right? Could be your glute on this side, could be the external, uh, externally rotated or internally rotated hip at the top, could be somewhere else, could be in the side here. Sometimes people get it in their side. And we'll hold that for just about one second. Then I'm done. That's it. It's an active mobilization. The more active we want to make it, the less we use the arms to support the body and the more we use the rotators of the hips to drive the movement. So now on this side, exhale, inhale, exhale, down towards the foot, sternum towards the foot, inhale, exhale, so I'm actively working my internal and external hip rotators while I do this. Notice that I can do a party trick and flex my spine to get my head really close to my, my leg if I want to, like this. I can go all the way to here. But what am I doing? I'm just flexing my spine in the thoracic region up around the rib cage to get there, maybe in the lumbar spine in here, right? That's not the point of this exercise. The point of this exercise is not to flex the spine, it's to work the hips. So I wanna roll my sacrum forward. That's down here. So I only go as far down as I can while keeping the back in line with the sacrum. I don't wanna decouple my spine from my sacrum. I want them to stay in the same plane. So I go to there about, and I go to the other side. And I'm just holding my hands behind my back so you can see that I'm using my legs to do that, right? So that's our 90-90 stretch. follow-up to the video I just recorded about exercises you must do, I will now record in my sauna. Because what better place is there to record stuff than in a sauna? Far infrared sauna, by the way. So I tried to do my best to get uh, some Ferris Bueller hair. There we go. That's all better. Much better. So here's the thing about these exercises is people have a bit of a broken belief system, we'll say around the idea of what any exercise needs to be. And I'm going to unpack this belief system more in a future podcast quite a bit because I think it's really important. However, what I want to say for right now is when you're doing these exercises, there are a few rules you want to follow or rather strong guidelines. One, no pain face. If you're making a pain face in any of these exercises, you're going way too deep. 
you should be in a place where you can do it without being in pain. And the second is that we want you to coordinate with the breath. So remember my cue on exhaling when you move towards the fetal position, your flexion, your inflection. So as a general rule, you can follow that. When you're inhaling, you're moving in extension away from the fetal position. When you're exhaling, you're moving towards flexion. That's really important. And then the third strong guideline is that we want to make sure that you are breathing only through the nose. So it's kind of the same rule as number one, which is no pain face. If you're mouth breathing, then you're going too deep. So I want you to back it up and relax a little bit. These are meant to be relaxing exercises. And what we're doing is training your nervous system to move in a better way, to move in a more comfortable and confident way, to explore end range of your body under load. So just take it easy on yourself and do it in a way that is productive, but not forceful in a way that makes gains and pushes the envelope without injury or insult to you or your body. You're here to help your body be more healthy. That's what's up. I hope you find these exercises useful for you. I feel like these are pretty much daily practice for me or most days. I do them frequently before I ride. This is a really important concept. Human bodies are a bit like the wheel of a bicycle. So when we have a wheel, <clears throat> it's made up of a rim and spokes and a hub. And all of these, <clears throat> excuse me, all these items together have tension. Uh, they have tension as a system. And that system of tension is called tensegrity. That's tension and integrity combined into a holistic system that where it's truly an illustration of the whole being more than the sum of the parts, right? Wheels are pretty remarkable devices or feats of engineering. If you ever take a single spoke, you can bend it and twist it. It's nothing more than a piece of wire. And you take even a rim, you can kind of sit on it and flex it. You can flex it in your hands sometimes, depending on how thick it is and how deep it is. But most rims are just sort of hoops of either carbon or aluminum, but we put that rim together with spokes and we tie a hub in the middle and then we put tension on all the spokes, roughly equal tension. And now we have this engineering structure that's capable of supporting our weight while we fly around corners or rip down hills or bunny hop curbs or sprint away from dogs. So it's a pretty amazing system. But it, the strength of that system and the integrity of that system is completely dependent on each of the individual components being functional and on the tension in those spokes being somewhat equal. So what happens when your wheel becomes out of true? What are the characteristics of wheel that is out of true? We bring it to the mechanic and he looks at it or she looks at it and discovers that some spokes, the wheel is wobbly, the rim is wobbly and probably out around. So you put it in, they put it in the truing stand of doing this and then they examine the spokes and some spokes will be too tight and some spokes will be too loose. And this makes a wobbly wheel. And this is how most human bodies are. What the spokes are an analogy for is the length tension relationships of the muscles and the fascial system. So we have tight spots in our fascial system, our fascial network. We have tight muscles in our muscular system. And so what we're doing is we're, we're spelunking to find out where these tight muscles are. And then we loosen them through mobilization. We can do that through stretching. We do that through foam rolling, myofascial release, maybe dry needling. There's lots of different ways to do it, but the point is you've got to figure out how to do it. You've got to get the right angle and the right tension to do it. And when we use an active muscle, that's a much better way than just passively stretching the muscle. It tends to work more effectively in my experience. So important takeaway about the wheel analogy is that if you took your out of true, out of round wheel to a mechanic and it had some spokes that were too loose and some that were too tight, and he or she simply tightened all the spokes, this would obviously not solve our problem. It would over tighten the spokes that were already too tight and it would bring some of the spokes that were too loose close to the correct tension, but we'd have a wheel with way too much tension and it still wouldn't be straight. And this would not solve our problem. This is the equivalent of taking a body, a human body that has poor length tension relationships in the muscle or in the fascial system and strength training only adding more strength to all the muscles. That's the same thing. So we're going to end up with a strong body that's really crooked. 
and has too much muscle tension. Conversely, if we go to yoga and we arbitrarily stretch all the spokes, we loosen all the spokes and take away the tension from all the spokes by doing yoga and yoga and stretching or any other excessive stretching modality. I'm not saying yoga is excessive. I'm saying in my example that it is. If we do that, then we end up with a, a wheel that has no tension or not enough tension. And this is obviously problematic because it's not a strong structure. We've taken all the tension out of the spokes. So when we mobilize the wrong joints or the wrong muscles or the wrong point in the fascia, we increase, we decrease tension in the wrong area. And this can be problematic. So we really have to have a little discernment about what we're trying to accomplish when we either stretch an area of the body or apply or increase tension to an area in the body, right? And the last thing I'll say is, it's very important to understand the relationship between the tensegrity of a system and the size of the engine, right? So this goes back to the most fundamental principle of you as an athlete. Your first job is to know thyself. This is, this is the first principle of athleticism. You have to know yourself. And I don't just mean know what color jeans you like to wear and what your favorite brand of chocolate is. You have to know yourself intimately, understand your own body, your limitations, strengths, and weaknesses, and not just your phenotype on the bike or your physiological strengths, but your neuromuscular type and your muscle tension tendencies. So when you understand how flexible you are globally and in specific areas, then you begin to make a corrective exercise program that strategically targets the areas you need work on. This is essential and fundamental for progress as an athlete. Otherwise, you're just going to hit the same wall over and over again, which is injury and pain, injury and pain, injury and pain, or a feeling of crookedness or a feeling of twistedness on the bike, which over a long enough timeline will probably result in injury and pain, injury and pain. So we want to avoid that scenario. So knowing yourself and understanding where you are in the spectrum of flexibility versus tension is very useful. And so the analogy we use is if someone has a very flexible body, overly mobile, we'll say, for their discipline, that can be problematic. Why? Because if you add strength to an overly mobile chassis, you end up with an athlete that can't control their power. This is the equivalent of buying an old crappy car, a 1982 Toyota Corolla or a Pinto or something, and dropping a 550 horsepower muscle car engine into it. You see the problem. Any engineer will tell you that a system has to work together and all the components have to be of the same quality to, for any system to work well. Otherwise, there's a weak link in the chain. So if we have an, a car with a huge monster engine in it and old struts and old suspension and crappy old tires and brakes that aren't great, then you're going to get in the car and start it up and floor it and rip off the line and go super fast and it's all going to be going great until you have to make a turn and then you're probably gonna fly right off the road because nothing will work. The suspension and struts won't be able to handle the power of the engine. So when you make yourself really strong, if you're too mobile, this can be an issue. If you don't have enough stability in the system, it can't handle the power of the engine. Conversely, if the struts and suspension are too tight, then we don't have the mobility we need to make power at the right moment. So cycling is a sport that is limited by range of motion for many athletes. And when you can't bring your knee all the way up to your chest with a dorsiflexed ankle, this is cycling in the aero position. And being aerodynamic is a demand of cycling. Even if you're a gravel specialist or a mountain biker, we have to have a low torso angle to some degree in order to handle the bike uh, during loose terrain and steep downhills. So. I hope all that information was helpful and thanks for listening to my podcast and watching my videos. And the last thing I'll say is ride consciously.